Well, without further ado, let us continue what we spoke about last evening. And uh, let's have prayer before we dive into this. Our series of messages, not all of them because we have so many. I think I'm, I'm speaking 11 times throughout the course of this week. But at least the first four, five, or six messages will be devoted to dealing with the basics of Christianity. Now, you might be saying, well, I know all about the basics of Christianity. I, I came up in Sabbath school and I went through church and I know the basics. My hunch is, is that not only do most of you not know important essential basics, but the reality is, is that many of your parents probably don't know them either. When I'm talking about I mean things like, why is it that I believe that God exists? That would be considered a properly basic belief. We have all uh, come here this morning, most of us wearing, you know, nicer clothes. And the reason for that is, is that we have come to worship God. Do you agree with that? Yes or no? So then our, our reason for gathering here this morning presupposes that God exists. Right? But if somebody asks you a question, and that question was namely this, how do you know that God exists? Could you give a compelling answer? Could you give a believable answer? Or do you, have you even thought about it? I mean, we've gathered here this morning to worship God in the name of Jesus, and that would raise a second question. Why do you choose to believe in Jesus Christ? Why is He unique? What sets Him apart? And these are the things we're talking about. We'll be reading today and studying from the Bible, and you have probably, many of you, been raised up with the presupposition, the pre-knowledge, the pre-commitment to the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. But if I ask you, why do you believe the Bible is the Word of God, what would you say? What evidentiary basis could you give for your belief in the authenticity of the Bible? Or do you just assume that it's true because your parents assume it's true and you figure they're trustworthy? Well, what if they just trusted their parents and they trusted their parents and they trusted their parents? This becomes uh, uh, problematic because we want some real reasons, some authentic reasons to believe the things that we believe. And so in the first at least five or six sessions, we're going to be dealing with these basic kinds of issues. We're going to ask you to think These messages will not be geared primarily at the heart, but at the mind. Because I'm mildly tempted to say that much of our preaching for young people is nothing more than emotional poppycock. And we just try to get you into an emotional high or an emotional fervor, and then we make an appeal and you come forward. But, But I want to give you a solid foundation as to why you believe what you believe so that you can actually intelligently, rationally, reasonably exercise saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to ask questions like, does God exist and how do I know that? Is the Bible the inspired Word of God and how do I know that? Is Jesus Christ unique in human history and if so, how do I know that? What basis do I have for believing these properly basic things? And I fear that many of us, uh, particularly uh, in the Adventist church, but probably in all Christian communions, take these things for granted. We just know they're true. We know that Jesus is our Savior. And we know that the Bible is true. And we know that God exists. But if somebody from a different mindset, from a different worldview, an atheist or an agnostic, or somebody else tried to engage you and ask you some of the tough questions, why is it that you believe in the existence of God? Most of us would would just be immediately, instantaneously stopped in our tracks. We might be able to, you know, blurt out something, well, you know, uh, 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 because um, he's real to me. But the atheist could just as easily counter, well, he's not real to me, so who's right? There needs to be some criterion, some foundation by which we establish the truthfulness and the veracity of the existence of God, the uniqueness of Jesus, and the authenticity of the Bible. And that's what we're going to be dealing with today. In fact... Today we're going to be dealing specifically with the uniqueness of Jesus Christ in history. What sets Jesus apart? The uniqueness of Jesus in history. Now, that's a little illogical because we probably should start with why I believe in God. But the reason that I'm choosing to, to to deal with Jesus this morning and His uniqueness is because I realize that this is the meeting in which most of you will attend. And I wanted to have the most important, the most power packed message uh, this morning. This evening we'll begin to deal with issues of why I believe in God, how I could demonstrate that my belief in God is intelligent, and uh, also my belief in the Bible, these sorts of things. And it's going to be a very, very, very fun weekend and a week, but you're going to have to be thinking 
And uh, as I quoted last night, Will Durant said, if you make people think they are thinking, they will love you, but if you make them think, they will hate you. And my goal this weekend is to make you think, not just think you're thinking. Let's have prayer together and then we'll begin. Father in heaven, we come before you now. We bow our heads, believing and trusting that you are real, that you exist, that you have our best interest in mind, that the Bible is in fact your inspired, inerrant Word of God, and that you will communicate to us through this Word this morning. Father, we believe in Jesus. As we now begin to explore these properly basic beliefs that we hold, show us, Lord, What rational, intelligent foundation do we have for these things that we believe? And Father, may our faith be strengthened and may it be girded and may it become more powerful through the course of this week as we realize this is not just some fanciful fairy tale, but it is in fact absolutely, totally true. Please, Father, be with us this week and particularly this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. How many of you brought your Bibles? I made a personal request last night that you would bring your Bibles. Raise your hand if you brought your Bible. Okay, good. Well, that's that's not bad. I'm going to ask that in the future, if you attend this meeting, that you please make an effort to, to bring your Bible. If you're sitting next to somebody else who has their Bible and you notice that somebody else near you doesn't have them, maybe you could just share amongst yourself so that everybody could at least have a Bible near them. Now, this morning, I, I want to ask you a question. Are there things in your experience that you know are true, but you could not prove it? Are there things in your experience that you know are true, that you know are right? You're going to forgive me here, man. I just can barely hear myself. You know are true, you know are accurate, you know are right, but you couldn't prove it. How many people say, yes, there are things like that? There are things like that. Okay, good. How many people say, no, there's nothing like that? Everything that I know I could prove. Beloved, listen to me very carefully. When we're talking about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ in history, the the truthfulness of the Bible, and the existence of God, there is a huge difference between what we know and what we can show. There is a huge difference between what I know is true and what I could prove is true. Let's talk about a few of these things. I know that I like the taste of vegetarian lasagna. Does anybody else here have that same experience? You know in your innermost soul that when you take a bite of vegetarian lasagna or any kind of lasagna, that that taste is enjoyable to you. How many people would say, that is my experience? Okay, good. Now, for those of us who have that experience, when we put that food into our mouth and we begin the process of mastication and we swallow it and we receive pleasure from that, we know in our innermost souls that we are experiencing satisfactory pleasure from the eating of this lasagna, but could we prove that? And if so, how would we go about proving it? You might say that you could, you could make some noises like, mmm, mmm, and you might even request another dish. Could I have a second helping of that vegetarian lasagna? And if you really wanted to demonstrate your, your favor toward this dish, you could say, could I have a third helping of this? So these would be outward things that you could do that would, that would try to demonstrate that you like it. Here's my question for you, though. Does that prove that you really do like vegetarian lasagna? Yes or no? No. It doesn't prove that you like vegetarian lasagna. It only indicates that it's probably true that you like it. Now, here's the important point, and don't miss this. You know in your inner soul, you know between your ears, behind your nose and in front of your neck, you know inside of your mind, your brain, your cranium, your experience, you know for sure that you do like the taste of vegetarian lasagna, but you could never prove it. Now, the fact that you can't prove it, does that take away from the fact that you know it's true? Yes or no? How about another one? My favorite color is green. Does anybody here like the color green? Does anybody here have a favorite color? Your favorite color is green, like me. That's my favorite. Okay, good. Now, can I prove to you that in my innermost soul, my favorite color is green? Could I prove that? Yes or no? No, no, no. Now, how might I try to prove it? Well, I I might decorate my entire room in what color? Green. I might buy a green car. 
I, I might do many things in which if you looked at, as an outward observer, you would say, wow, David really likes green, but what if it's all a conspiracy? What if I really like red, but I'm just putting on that I like green? You follow me? In other words, the point here is this. I know in my experience, my innermost soul between, between my ears, behind my nose and in front of my neck, inside of this thing, I know that green is my favorite color, but I could never prove it. You follow me? When I was young, I had a skateboard, and uh, I was rolling down the hill, and I, this is before I really got into skateboarding. I was just about four years old, and I was rolling down this hill, in front of my house, I was just out, it was, the sun was about ready to set, I was all by myself, and I was laying on my stomach on the skateboard. And uh, if you've ever skateboarded before, you know that if you hit a rock, a small piece of gravel, at, at just the right angle and trajectory and all of that, it will instantaneously stop the wheel from rolling, right? Well, I was rolling down this hill, not very fast, but fast enough, and I, the skateboard came to about right here on me, right? So as I was rolling down, you know, the uh, cement was right here, and I was having fun, woo, woo, rolling down on my stomach like this. And just in a second, the, the skateboard stopped, and my face just went like this, whack, right on the ground. And uh, it hurt, to, to say the least. Now, here's the incredible thing. I didn't bleed, I didn't break my nose, I didn't damage my teeth, nothing. But it really, really hurt. Now, I was the only person there. Now, I know that that experience is true. I was there. I experienced it, but I could never prove to you that that experience actually happened. How would I go about proving it? I, I have no video. I have no tape recording. I have no film. I have no pictures. I could never prove to you that it happened, but I know that it's true. Now, let me give you one more example, and I want to share with you why I am sharing this. Imagine with me that you take a trip overseas. Let's say you go to Indonesia. And you arrive there in Indonesia and you're looking forward to a wonderful time of scuba diving and snorkeling and laying on the beach, maybe a little surfing, and you're just looking forward to a wonderful time. But as soon as you walk off of the plane, you are apprehended by a number of, of law enforcement officers and they put you in handcuffs and they cart you away. They're treating you rather roughly. They throw you into the car. They take you down to the prison and they say, we know for a fact that you are smuggling drugs into this country. Now, here's the incredible thing. You're innocent. And you know that you are innocent. But let's just say in our hypothetical scenario here that all different kinds of evidence and witnesses and other things are brought forward and the circumstantial evidence, for some reason you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the circumstantial evidence looks like you are totally guilty. All of the witnesses, all of the testimony, all of the, the corroborative evidence indicates that you are totally guilty, but you know that you're just going to Indonesia for a vacation. You know you're not a drug smuggler, but all of the evidence indicates that you are. Now, let me ask you a question. Does all of that evidence, all of that mounting indication that you are guilty, does this ever begin to make you think you're guilty? Yes or no? Never. You know that you are innocent, even though you might not be able to show you are innocent. The reason for this, beloved, it is essential that you grasp this. When we are talking about the proofs for God's existence, and the proofs of the veracity of the Bible, and the proofs for the uniqueness of Jesus Christ... The reality is that you can, and you're listening very carefully now, you can know that these things are true and not be able to show it. Why? Because you have the inner witness of its truthfulness. You have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit that has spoken directly to your heart and said, it is true that God exists. It is true that Jesus is your Savior. It is true that the Bible is the Holy Word of God. It is true that you are justly condemned before a righteous God. It is true that Jesus died to reconcile all of humanity. And you can know all of these truths internally, but not be able to prove it. Now follow me carefully here. I told you I'd be making you think. Just because you may or may not be able to prove it, does not mean then that we should not make great efforts to demonstrate that our faith, our confidence relies or stands 
on a rational, reasonable basis. While you might not be able to prove that your inner witness tells you that Jesus is real, you should be able to ask intelligent questions like, is there other evidence, external evidence, what kinds of evidence? External evidence that would corroborate my experience. If somebody came to this stage this morning and said, I have the internal witness that I am God, he could believe in his innermost soul that he is God, but does that mean that it's true because he has the inner witness, yes or no? No. We would say, by what criterion do you say you are God? Give us evidence. Give us external. You have the internal indications, and that's fine, but we want external proof. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ calls you to Himself, draws you through the cross, and you find yourself weeping and calling out for mercy at the foot of Golgotha's hill, you know in your heart of hearts that you are justly condemned before a holy God. And you know in your heart of hearts that the Lord Jesus Christ saved you on the cross. You know this to be true. Can somebody say amen? You have come forward at an altar call. That preacher preached that sermon. It broke your heart. You came forward. You knelt down. You prayed. You wept. You gave your life to Jesus. And you know in your innermost soul that your experience was true. But here's the catch. Are there other external indicators that would corroborate your experience? Or is it simply the fancy of your own emotions? Now, there's two points here, and I want to just quickly recap them and then get right into this important message. Number one, you can know something is true at times, even though you might not be able to show it. Number two, if something is actually true, it should correspond with reality. If something is actually true, it should correspond with reality. Let me make a statement. You tell me if the statement is true or false. The Los Angeles Lakers won the 2003 NBA title. True or false? False. Second statement. The San Antonio Spurs won the 2003 NBA title. True or false? True. What makes the first statement false? That the Los Angeles Lakers uh, were the winners of the 2003 NBA title. Most of you say that statement is false. On what basis do we determine that that statement is not true? Because what? Because the Spurs won. Let's make it even simpler. Because that statement does not correspond with reality. Do you follow me? That statement does not correspond with reality. And so we say it is an untrue statement. Now, if I say that San Antonio Spurs won the 2003 uh, NBA title, you would say that statement is what? True. Why? Because it corresponds with reality. If I said the pews you're sitting on are green, that the upholstery is green, would you say that statement is true or false? Come on now, you can speak louder than that. That statement is what? False. Why is it false? Now you're giving me the, you're giving me the easy answer. You're saying because it's red. Well, the problem is, is what if I called green what we all call red, and I called red what we all call green. Ah, the point here is just this. In order for things to be true, they must correspond with reality. Does that make sense, yes or no? Say yes if it makes sense. Now you're saying, man, this is deep. I I can't follow all of this. Well, beloved, you need to follow it, and you're going to follow it, and it's going to make good sense when we get to the end of this. In order for things to be true, they must correspond with reality. Now, why is that so important? Precisely because of this. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus made an incredible statement. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus here makes an exclusive claim to being the sole contact point with God. He went on to say, no one comes unto the Father but by me. Now, that would cause us to ask a question. How would we go about proving whether or not Jesus' claim is true? Jesus Jesus used the singular definite article, the. 
So I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He did not use the indefinite article A. I am a way and a truth and a life. The singular definite article. In other words, to the exclusion of all other truths, to the exclusion of all other ways, to the exclusion of all other lives, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. My question for you today is, how do we determine whether or not that statement is true? That it corresponds with reality? And my question is, my my suspicion is that most of us in this room could not give a good answer to that question. Today I want to give you five reasons. Five reasons why I believe in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ in history. You probably take this for granted. Most of you probably take it for granted that Jesus is the Savior, He's the divine Son of God, that He died on Golgotha's hill for your sins. But I want today to give you a rational, reasonable basis so that you can show that thing that you know. Did Jesus claim that He was the sole contact point with the Father? Did that claim have any correspondence with reality? I say the answer is yes. Let me give you five reasons. Number one, the testimony of Jesus Christ Himself. The testimony of Jesus Christ Himself. Go with me in your Bible to John chapter 5. If you brought your Bibles, go with me quickly to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And I want you to notice with me several verses here. Now, Jesus is speaking. John chapter 5. If if your Bible has the words of Jesus in red, you will notice here that the words are in red. John chapter 5, and notice with me several verses. We're just going to go through these in rapid-fire succession. John chapter 5, and I'm reading in verse 22. What verse am I reading? 22. For the Father judges no one, no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Verse 23. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Three words. Who sent Him? According to Jesus' statement here, who sent Him? Who, everyone? Now, I can barely hear up here because of these fans, so I need you to be more enthusiastic, more vi- have more vigor than that. Who sent Him? God. The Father. According to this claim that Jesus makes, the Father sent Him. Notice with me verse 30. John chapter 5 and verse 30. The Bible says this. John chapter 5, and I'm reading now in verse 30. It says, I can of my o- myself do nothing, my own self do nothing, as I hear I judge... And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father. What are those next three words? Who what? Who sent me. Notice two more verses still in John chapter 5, verse 36. But I have a greater witness the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has... What are the next two words? Sent me. Verse 37. And the Father Himself... What are the next three words? Who sent me has testified of me, you have neither heard His voice at any time, nor seen His form. So if we could bring Jesus Christ right today in person, His actual personage, bring Him into this sanctuary, put Him here on the platform and say, Jesus, when you came to planet Earth, following your incarnation, who sent you? What would He say? He would say what? He would say, my Father hath sent me. In other words, God has sent me. So the claim that Jesus made about Himself was that He was sent from God. Was that claim true? Now don't answer yet. So you know it's true because you've been raised that way. You learned it in Sabbath school. We're going to evaluate today whether or not we have good reason to believe in the truthfulness of that claim. Let's consider some of the other claims that Jesus made about Himself. I'm thinking of John chapter 8 and verse 58. Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. The Jews had challenged him and said, this is ridiculous. You're not even 50 years old yet. How is it possible that you saw Abraham's day? And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. What statement was Jesus making when He said, before Abraham was, I am? What was Jesus saying? He's saying, I'm God, wasn't He? Back in Exodus chapter 3, you remember Moses, the Midianite shepherd, had happened upon that burning bush, and uh, uh, the burning bush had said to Moses, Moses, go down and tell that rascal Pharaoh to let my people go. And, and Moses' rejoinder was, who shall I say sent me? On what basis should I say that, that Pharaoh should let the children of Israel go? And you remember what his response was? He said, you tell them that I am that I am hath sent you. I am has sent you. 
So when Jesus here says, before Abraham was, I am, Jesus is saying, and you're listening carefully now, that I am the God that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Now think about that for just a second. Here's Jesus. We don't know how tall he was. We'll say he was five foot eleven. We'll say he weighed about 175. So here's a man. I mean, a man that had ten toes and ten fingers and two legs and two arms and a neck, just like all of us. He was a human being, and, and he, he drank like you drank, he slept like you slept, he ate like you ate, he walked like you walked. I mean, he woke up in the middle of the night. Uh, you, you understand. And here's this man who has the audacity to say to the people of that day, I am the God that spoke to Moses. Is that a radical claim, yes or no? I said, is that a radical claim, yes or no? So on one, on one occasion, Jesus says, the Father has sent me, the Father has sent me, the Father has sent me, the Father has sent me. On another occasion, Jesus says, I am. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. What does Jesus mean by that? What does Jesus mean when He says, I and my Father are one? What claim is He making? He is making the claim that He is the co-equal with God. I am the co-equal with the Father who sent me. I and my Father are one. Another incredible claim made by Jesus. Let me share with you just one more. It's one we've already alluded to. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man, no one cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus here makes the claim to exclusivity. Jesus here makes the claim that He is it. That there is no other way to get to God. There is no other conduit. There is no other pathway to approach God but through Jesus. He makes the radical, elite claim, the exclusive claim to being the one way, the singular way, the only way to get into a contact relationship with God. Is that a radical claim, yes or no? Now let's evaluate the claims that Jesus made and then let us draw a reasonable conclusion. Did Jesus believe that He was sent from the Father, yes? Did Jesus believe that He was the God of the Old Testament, yes or no? Did Jesus believe that He was the co-equal with God, yes or no? Did Jesus believe that He was the exclusive point of contact with God, yes or no? Are these incredible claims? Fantastically incredible claims. Now let me ask you a question. As we survey the length and breadth of history, has any other religious figure in the history of the, the, the entire human spectrum ever made these kinds of claims? For example, did Muhammad, the author of the Quran, ever make these kinds of claims? No. Never. Uh, not even one one hundredth of these kinds of claims. Did Buddha, Gautama Buddha, ever make these kinds of claims? Yes or no? Never. You can survey the length and breadth of human religions and ask the question, has any other viable religious figure ever made these kinds of claims? And the answer is no, 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 no. This led C.S. Lewis to, to draw an important conclusion, and I hope that your, your antennas are up right now. C.S. Lewis said, who by the way was an atheist, he was an Oxford scholar, and if you've not read the book Mere Christianity yet, you need to read it. You need to read that book. Write that down. Mere Christianity. I was just at Wisconsin camp meeting the other day and I said, how many of you have read the book Mere Christianity? And in about 4,000 people, maybe two or three raised their hand. This is a tragedy. Every single Christian should read that book. So this led C.S. Lewis to draw the conclusion. He was an atheist that converted to Christianity. He was an extremely erudite, intelligent man. He was an Oxford scholar. And he said, based upon the claims that Jesus made about Himself, Jesus can be only one of three things. Based upon the claims... The what word did I say? The claims that Jesus made about Himself. He can be only one of three things. C.S. Lewis, the great Oxford scholar, said he was either a liar, he was either a lunatic, or the Lord. Do you follow that line of reasoning? Yes or no? 
Either he was lying when he made these far-reaching claims, or he was mentally unstable when he made these far-reaching claims, or he was telling the truth. Let me give you a good practical application of this. Our friends, the Muslims, believe that Jesus was a prophet. Our friends, the Muslims, believe that Jesus was one of the most important prophets ever. The top six. They also believe that Jesus was a good man. Now, if we were to ask our friends, the Buddhists, what they think about Jesus, they would say that He was a fantastically good moral teacher. If we were to even ask some atheists and agnostics and others, like W.E.H. Leckie, we were to say, what do you think of Jesus? He would say He was a fantastic proponent of morality. A good man. The problem is, is that Jesus made claims that prevent us from simply pigeonholing Him as a good man. If somebody came bounding into our meeting this morning and stood up on this stage and said, I am sent from God. I am God. I am the sole contact point with God. I am, in fact, co-equal with God. We would never say, well, He's a good man. He's a good guy. He's a good moral teacher. We would say one of three things. Either He's crazy. That would probably be the first thing we would think. By the way, the people of Jesus' day said that very thing. They said He was a Samaritan. They said He was a wine-bibber. They said He had a demon. In other words, they were saying you're mentally unstable. We would either say that this gentleman was crazy, he was, he was a lunatic, or he was lying, he was just making the whole thing up as some sort of fictional fantasy, or we would deduce that he was telling the truth. So point number one, the claims that Jesus made about himself, while we cannot yet prove that they correspond with reality, we can be sure that they were incredible claims and that no other human being ever made claims like this. And we must come to grips with the fact, every one of us, that Jesus is one of three things. He was either lying, He was either a lunatic, or He was in fact the Lord of glory. Number two. Number two. The testimony of the disciples. The testimony of the disciples. Go with me to John chapter 20. You're right there in the Gospel of John. Look with me at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Now, this is fascinating here. John chapter 20, and I'm reading in verse 30. John chapter 20 and verse 30. The Bible says, And truly, Jesus did... This is John writing. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book. In other words, this book is not an exhaustive account of everything that Jesus did. Verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. If we were to bring John here this morning, set him up on the platform and say, John, why did you write your Evangelion? Why did you write your Gospel? What would he say? Why did John write his Gospel, according to those verses? Why? What is it? To, 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 to testify that, that he believed that Jesus was the Christ. Are you comfortable with that? Yes or no? So did John believe that Jesus was the Christ? Did John believe that all of those claims that Jesus made about Himself were true? Is that why John wrote his Gospel? Okay. So, the disciples then, at least John, believed that Jesus' claims were true. Were there other disciples that believed in the truth claims of Jesus? How about about Peter? Remember when, uh, on one occasion, Jesus took a public opinion survey... And he said, who do men say I am? Matthew 16, who do, who do men say I am? And they, oh, Jesus, it's incredible. Some people say you are John the Baptist. And some people say you are Jeremiah. And some people say you are, and they, and they went through the list. And then Jesus says, all right, I'm satisfied that you have given me an accurate representation of what the public opinion is. Now my question is, who do you think I am? And do you remember what Peter said? Peter spoke up and said, does anybody know it by heart? Thou art the Christ, comma, the Son of the living God. Did Peter believe that Jesus Christ was divine? Yes or no? Did Peter believe that Jesus Christ was co-equal with God? Yes or no? Did Jesus Christ believe that... Or pardon me, did Peter believe that Jesus Christ was in fact the sole contact point with the Father? 
Yes, he did. Now, what if we could ask the other disciples? What if we could ask Mary Magdalene? Do you think she believed in the truth claims of Jesus? What if we could ask Nicodemus? Do you think he believed in the truth claims of Jesus? The answer is yes. Every single disciple, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, all of the, the original disciples, and then into the, new, into the gospel dispensation, Stephen and others, do you believe in the truth claims of Jesus? Every one of those disciples would have said, I believe that the claims that Jesus made about himself were true. Now let's talk about that for just a moment. How many of you here, I suspect it won't be many of you, how many of you here are married? Raise your hands if you're married. Jake, you're not married. Okay, how many here have brothers or sisters? Okay, good. This will be a better illustration. Do you know your brothers and sisters pretty well? Yes or no? Do you know them better than than most folk? Yeah, you do, don't you? And uh, do you ever think to yourself, or a brother, you ever think to yourself, um, may, maybe they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? And you, you might just think to yourself for a second, you know, if you knew what I knew about my brother, <laughs> you would not be interested. Right? Or you might think to yourself, if you knew what I knew about my sister, you wouldn't think so highly of her. In other words, those with whom we are the closest, they know us the best. Isn't that true? Let me give you a great example as a preacher. Where's my lovely bride? This is my lovely wife standing up right there. Stand up, Violetta. Say hi. This is Violetta, and this is, this is my son, Jabel, one of my two boys. Now, I can stand up here and I can preach. Listen carefully now. And you might be totally convinced that I'm a Christian. And you might be totally convinced that I'm filled with the Spirit. I'm not saying you are, but you might be. But you want to know something? That really doesn't matter. What actually matters is, what do the people who are closest to me think? It's one thing if you think I'm a Christian, but you only see me on Sabbath morning wearing my suit and tie. The question is, does my wife think I'm a Christian? Now, let me ask you a question. Would it make any difference to you how this sermon sounds? if you knew that my wife thought I was a hypocrite? Would that make any difference to you, yes or no? Would you tune me out? I guarantee you would. If you knew that my wife thought I was a fake and a phony and a liar and a hypocrite, you would instantaneously reevaluate what you think about me. Now let's think about this from Jesus' perspective. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, and all of the first century disciples talked with Jesus, walked with Jesus, slept with Jesus, ate with Jesus, had recreation time with Jesus, spent all different kinds of time with Jesus. In other words, they saw Him at His closest. They saw Him wake up in the middle of the night. Are you ever grumpy in the mornings? How many of you are grumpy in the morning? All right, probably more of you than will admit it. I'm a morning person, right? And I am just invariably bubbly in the mornings, right? Well, you know what's interesting? Jesus' disciples would have seen Jesus go to bed late and then have to get up early because people were prodding Him and and pushing upon Him. And this would have been an opportunity for Jesus to become frustrated and grumpy. They could have been watching Him like a hawk. And the very ones who were closest to Jesus the very ones who who slept with Him and walked with Him and talked with Him and ate with Him and spent all of that time with Him, even these people said, we believe in His incredible claims. Now, is that significant? Yes or no? Absolutely. Beloved, let me tell you something. What you think about yourself is important. But what others think about you is probably more important in this sense. It's one thing for Jesus to say, I am God... It is quite a different thing for other people to say, we believe that His claims are true. We have seen His life, we have seen the way He lives, the way He walks, the way He talks, the way He eats, the way that He breathes, and we see no inconsistency. So number two, the testimony of His disciples. Number three, the testimony even of Jesus' enemies. And this is fun. Go with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 45, John chapter 7 and verse 45. This is, this is classic 
This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, even though it's very short. John chapter 7 and verse 45. Now watch this very carefully here. John chapter 7. You folks can come on in. You're not such big sinners that you can't come in. Come on in. John chapter 7. You don't have to dwell in the outer court. John chapter 7 and verse 45. Gentiles are allowed. Come on in. Plenty of seats. John chapter 7. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? Now, we don't know all of the details of the story, but let me fill in the blanks, Oliver. The Pharisees didn't like Jesus one bit. Neither did the Sadducees or the scribes. And they were, he was a thorn in the flesh to their established religious hierarchy. And so they decided the best way to deal with this Jesus problem is to get rid of them. And this was early on, earlier on in his ministry, and so they weren't yet ready to kill him, but they said, we'll just arrest him. And so they hired some Roman centurions, right? And we don't know how many they hired. We'll say they hired four. So the scribes, the Pharisees go up and they say, all right, we got this character Jesus who's given us all kinds of problems. He's upending the way that the religious uh, establishment that we have taken years to set up. And so we just want to arrest this guy, get him out of our hair and throw him in a prison for a while. People will forget about him. Then maybe we can let him out someday down the road. So they go and hire these centurions. Now, here's the picture I want you to get in your mind. Here's these four big brutes. Big, you know, the picture I have, I have a very creative imagination. Big Roman brutes with their hat on and their spear and their sword. And uh, they've been paid now. And the scribes and Pharisees say, go get this fella. And so here they go. Going to arrest Jesus. (laughs) Going to go get Jesus. (laughs) Right? These big ogres. (laughs) And they're going to go find Jesus. And sure enough, they find where Jesus is. There's a large crowd gathered around. You know, five or 10,000 people perhaps. On one occasion, he fed 5,000 men plus women and children. And so, <laughs> they find Jesus. And here's the crowd. And Jesus, of course, is teaching. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Jesus is teaching. He's giving his sermon. And here they come. <laughs> they got to push through the crowd. <laughs> going to arrest Jesus. And as they're pushing their way through the crowd, they hear something that Jesus says. <laughs> good point. Oh, I like that. Good illustration. And all of a sudden, these four guards that have gone to arrest Jesus are now in rapt attention at the words of Jesus. And, and I don't know how the story went, but in my imagination, the sermon finishes, Jesus dismisses them, and everybody's going home. Wow, that was a great sermon. Here go these guards, you know. <clears throat> good sermon. Good sermon. And they're going back, and they walk to the temple, and, and as they approach the scribes and Pharisees, the scribes and Pharisees pull out their hair proverbially and say, uh, where's Jesus? Why didn't you bring him? And look at this response. This is absolutely classic. I, I absolutely love this. Where did I put my Bible? There it is. Look at this. This is great. John chapter 7, verse 46. Well, where is Jesus? Why didn't you bring him? And notice this. Verse 46. The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Incredible. Incredible. What is the dictionary definition of unique? Does anyone know? Anybody know? What's the dictionary definition of unique? Normally I bring my dictionary, but I forgot it this morning. What does the word unique mean? Oh, come on now. I know we've got some A students in here. What's unique mean? One of a kind. Unlike any other. Is that fair? So look at what they say about Jesus. Verse 46. No man ever spoke like this man. Could we paraphrase as saying, this man is unique? Would that be a safe paraphrase? Yes or no? Okay. So number one, the testimony of Jesus Himself. I am unique. Number two, the testimony of the disciples, those who were closest to Him. He was unique. And number three, incredibly, the testimony of His enemies. He's unique. Now, beloved, it's one thing if your friends speak well of you. It is quite a different thing if your enemies speak well of you. Go with me to Matthew chapter 27. Watch this. What's taking place in Matthew chapter 27? Jesus has died on the cross. We know this. This is the story of the crucifixion. So Matthew chapter 27, and I'm reading now in verse 54. Matthew chapter 27, and I'm reading in verse 54. What verse am I reading from? 54. Notice this. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, 
feared greatly. So they, we don't know how many there was, but there was a plurality. Maybe there were ten. Let's say there were ten. They, the ten, feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the who? This was who, everyone? No, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Who's saying this? Peter, right? Who's saying this? The very ones, the Roman centurions who had been asked to guard Jesus, probably the very ones responsible for His Now, let us that rest upon you there for a moment. The very ones who had just crucified Him, just, just moments following His death, say, you know what, fellas? We made a mistake. Truly, this was the Son of God. Even Jesus, and you're listening carefully now, even Jesus' enemies, recognized His incredible uniqueness. Unique in life, unique in claims, unique in speech, His uniqueness. Number four, the testimony of history. The testimony of history. Let me ask you a question. This is, this is a, a logical question and it can be empirically tested. Has the importance and significance of Jesus Christ decreased or increased over the last 2,000 years? The significance, importance of the person of Jesus increased or decreased over the last 2,000 years? How many say increase? How many say decrease? How many disciples were there in the first century? How many? We don't know exactly, but precious few. Less than 500. Right? How many people today claim the name of Jesus? Two billion. Right? If you take the entire Protestant world and the entire uh, world of Catholicity, you have two billion people, give or take several million, that name the name of Jesus. Now, is that an exponential increase or a decrease in the significance of the person of Jesus? That would be a radical increase. So the testimony of history bears witness to the fact that Jesus is unique. Now, that doesn't necessarily prove that His claims are true, but it does indicate that His claims were compelling. Let me ask you another question here. How many of the disciples died a martyr's death? How many of the disciples died a martyr's death? All but John and Judas. Did Judas die a martyr's death? No, he killed himself. So get this picture in your mind with me now. Let's say that the whole thing with Christianity was a farce. Let's say the whole thing is made up. Now, I want to share something with you here that if you'll put your thinking cap on for just a second, you will, you will understand something extremely important. Let's put ourselves right now into the life of those first century disciples. Okay? They believed that Jesus had died and rose again. Is that statement true or false? True. Now, the claim made by the Jews in the early century was that they had gone and found where the body of Jesus was, and they had taken the body, and they had ran off and burned it or hid it or disposed of it, and then they made up this whole tale about about a resurrection. Now, let's say I'm... One of the disciples. We'll say Thomas. Tradition tells us that Thomas sailed down to where? Does anybody know? India. And he began to preach the the, the gospel in India. He was buried in Madras. Okay? And let's say I'm Thomas. And this is 30 or 40 years after we've hid the body of Jesus and made up this whole concocted story. And now it comes time for me to lay down my life. You follow me now? And here they go. Here come the the big fellas. And they put my neck on the block. Right? And I know the thing is a lie. I know right where we hid the body, I know I made up the whole thing, and everybody else is in, our, in on our little conspiracy. I know the thing is a lie, and here I'm about ready to have my head chopped off for something I know is untrue. You think you could get a man to die for what he knew was a lie, yes or no? No. And you know what would be even harder? To get ten men to do it. You see the importance of this? All you would have had to do in the first century... All you would have had to do to stop instantaneously the growth of Christianity was show the body of Jesus. 
If you could have produced the body of Jesus, you could have said, they're saying that He was resurrected, but here's His body. And instantaneously, immediately, in a flash, in a moment, Christianity would have died. The claim of the early century Christians was that He was risen from the dead and that He was at the right hand of God. And that claim could have been instantaneously shown to be false if they simply would have produced the body of Jesus. 2,000 years has transpired and still no body has been found. Why? Because Jesus is in heaven. Now the point here is just this. Beloved, those disciples actually believed that Jesus had died and gone, or had, that He had risen and gone to heaven. Otherwise, they would have never, ever consented to die for something they knew was a lie. Well, I see a few of you yawning, so I want to cut right to the chase here on the last two points. Who wrote the book of 2 Corinthians? Who? Paul. Tell me about Paul. Was Paul a Jew? Was Paul a Roman citizen? What city was Paul from? Tarsus. Do you know anything about Tarsus? It was a city that was steeped in the Greek Hellenistic culture. Okay? So let's get a picture of Paul here. Paul was a Hebrew who was a Roman citizen who was raised in a Greek city. You got it? So there was the convergence of three cultures in the days of Paul, right? The Hebrew culture, the Greek culture, and the Roman culture. You follow me now? Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Real quickly on the testimony of history. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is incredible. Incredible. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul writing, a Hebrew by birth, a Roman citizen, and a Greek, raised in a Greek city. Not a Greek by ethnicity, but a Greek by education. You follow? So watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm reading in verse 6. What verse am I reading in? The Apostle Paul says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Now follow me very carefully here. If you could distill the pursuit of the Roman culture, Roman society down to a single word, what would that word be? Glory. All roads lead to Rome. Rome wasn't built in a day. Rome was that empire that lasted for hundreds of years. And so if you could distill what Rome was all about, in a word, it was glory. The glory of the iron monarchy of Rome. What if you could distill what the Greek culture, the Greek empire was about into a single word? What word would that be? It would be knowledge, wouldn't it? Are you familiar with names like Plato? Seneca, Socrates, Aristotle. What ethnicity were these men? They were what? Greeks. How many of you attended an academy? In your lifetime, you attended an academy. Raise your hand high to heaven. Where did the academy from? The whole concept of the academy is, is patently Greek. Has anybody here ever attended a university? Raise your hand. Where does the whole idea of a university come from? The Greek Hellenistic culture. The university is two words put together. Unity and diversity. Those words come together and form the conglomerate word university. Because the Greeks brought all of the different disciplines together into a single proximate location and they called it a unity and diversity. A university. And today, almost our entire educational system is patterned after the Greeks. What were the Greeks all about? Knowledge. Knowledge. The great philosophers were Greeks. Now, what if you could distill the Hebrew culture down into a single word? Light. 
Notice how prominent and preeminent the concept of light is in the Old Testament. God said, let there be light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Shekinah light, the glory of God is a light, a light. So many times, this, this imagery of the, the Israelite people being a light to those who are in darkness, a light of God to those who are wasting away and pining away in sin, this was the imagery of the, of the Hebrews. Light. Now, remember, Paul was a, a three-tiered citizen, right? He was a Roman citizen, he was a Hebrew by birth, and he was a Greek in terms of his educational upbringing. So, three cultures, the pursuit of glory, the pursuit of knowledge, and the pursuit of light. Now, read the verse again. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, where did all of these cultures find their consummation? The light, that is the Hebrews, of the knowledge, that is the Greeks, of the glory, that is the Romans. Where do all of these cultures and every culture find their consummation? He says, in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Paul here fuses all three. The Greek culture, the Roman culture, and the Hebrew culture fuses them all together and says, Jesus Christ is the consummation, the apex of every culture. So number four, the testimony of history. 2,000 years has not diminished the significance of Jesus. It has radically increased. And so let's quickly review and we'll move to our last point and close. Number one, the claims that Jesus made about Himself. The testimony of Jesus about Himself. Number two, the testimony of the disciples, those who were closest to Him. Number three, the testimony of Jesus' enemies. And number four, The testimony of history in number five. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Number five is the testimony of David Asherick. It's true, isn't it? My own personal testimony tells me that the claims of Jesus are true. See, this is where the rubber meets the road. Ultimately, what Jesus said about Himself is not authenticated internally. It must be authenticated externally. So we have the disciples. So the disciples externally authenticate the claims of Jesus. Then we have the enemies. They externally authenticate the claims of Jesus. Then we have history and eons after eons, years after years, epic after epic, epic has confirmed externally the claims of Jesus. But all of this does not matter unless it can be internally authenticated in my own experience. And I am here to tell you today that my, my experience is that the claims of Jesus Christ, the truth claims that He is the way and the truth and the life, I have found all of these claims, all of these to be authenticated and proved true in my experience. He is not just the truth, my way. He is not just the truth, He is my truth. He is not just the life, He is my life. And beloved, here's the point. I know in my heart of hearts that Jesus is real. I know in my heart of hearts that Jesus is unique. I know in my heart of hearts that the claims of Jesus are peerless and unmatched in the spectrum of history. I know all of that, but I cannot 100% unequivocally prove it or show it. The evidence all points in that direction. But if there's that person in here today, that person in your life who is waiting for proof, full, total disclosure that God is real and Jesus is unique and all of this, you will never get it. I was just at a camp meeting and a man came up to me and said, I hate God and I hate Jesus Christ because I prayed ten years ago that Jesus would prove Himself to me, that He would come in bodily form and reveal Himself to me, and He hasn't done it, and I've not prayed in ten years. I have no intentions of it. I do not believe in God, because if He was real, if He was true, if Jesus was real, true, and unique, He would prove it to me and He would show it to me. And, 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 and He was sort of boasting this to me, and I said, Brother, you are committing an egregious error. Because the claim of God is that He has already revealed Himself. You're waiting for something. You're 2,000 years late. God has already revealed Himself in the person of Jesus. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You're waiting for Jesus to come and reveal Himself to you in person. 
I said, who are you, you rotten, stinking piece of dust to make a claim of the sovereign God of the universe? He has already met your claim. You only are called to believe it. Who do we think we are to make claims of God? I'll believe in God if He gives me a symbol. I'll believe in God if He answers my prayer. I'll believe in God if He gives me some evidentiary basis. No, no, no. The evidence, brothers and sisters, is all right here. The testimony of Jesus, the testimony of His disciples, the testimony of His enemies, the testimony of history, and most importantly, if you will surrender your entire life to Jesus Christ, you will have the internal authentication that Jesus is real in your own experience. And somebody might come up and say, there is no God, there is no Jesus. And you say, are you kidding me? He lives in my heart. Has anyone here ever been to Madagascar? Anyone? Does anybody here know what Madagascar is? Where's Madagascar? It's off the east coast of Africa, isn't it? Southeast coast. Okay, nobody here has ever been there. How many people in this room today believe that Madagascar exists? Come on now, you believe it. Now, now wait a minute, this is curious. Not one of you has ever been there. And yet you are all totally convinced that it exists. On what basis do you believe that Madagascar exists? You believe it on the testimony of others. Isn't that true? You've never been there in your life. And you might say, well, I could go there. Well, you know, you could get in that plane and you have no clue what direction that pilot's flying. He could land on Iceland and call the thing Madagascar and you wouldn't know the difference. You know, this is a curious phenomenon here. Not one of us in this room has been to Madagascar, yet we are all totally certain that the place exists. Now, imagine with me for just a second here. Imagine with me that you had gone to Madagascar. Let's pretend like you're even there. And you're talking on your cell phone, and you call up your friend and say, wow, I'm in Madagascar, and it's beautiful. You should be here. I mean, Madagascar is incredible. And your friend says, are you kidding me? There is no Madagascar. Now, by the same criterion, I know that God is real. So for you to say, well, I'm not sure God really exists, I say fooey on that. Beloved, if you have an experience with Jesus, number one is important, the claims that Jesus made about Himself. Number two is important, the claims that the disciples made about Jesus. Number three is important, the claims that the enemies of Jesus made about Him. Number four is important, even the testimony of history. But all these things are, are arrows. What word did I say? Arrows. They all point to the fact that it's probably true what Jesus said. They're all indications that that corroborate our belief. But the capstone and the most important thing is that you personally have a a powerful experiential relationship with Jesus. And beloved, if you have that, there will never be need to doubt in the authenticity of the Bible, in the truth claims of Jesus Christ, and in the existence of God, because to do so would be to doubt even your own existence. And by the way, many of the Greek philosophers began to do that very same thing. That's why René Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. These men became so smart that they actually began to doubt that they even existed. Beloved, you can bypass all of that philosophical poppycock and just make the simple deduction, I exist. Jesus died on the cross to save me. He made that claim. I have accepted Him into my heart. And now my spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit that the claims of the Bible are true. For people who doubt, for people who are unsure and always shaking like a reed, these people that you meet that are on fire this year and out of the church this year, on fire this month and out of the church this month. Beloved, the reason for this sort of vacillation going back and forth like a reed in the wind is they don't have an experience. If you, I have an experience with Mickey Mallory. I can touch him. I can feel him. He's here. I have a relationship with him. He's my friend. Now, if you came up to me and said, Mickey Mallory doesn't exist, I would think you were crazy. Why am I so confident that Mickey exists? Not because you have an experience with him, but because I do. Beloved, I want to urge you this morning, with all of the energy that I can muster, to realize that a belief in Jesus Christ does not have to be some emotional, fanciful, 
frenzy. It doesn't have to be something that happens only at week of prayer. It does not have to be something that happens only at camp meeting. A relationship with Jesus Christ is an intelligent thing in which you can have a daily, growing, dynamic experience with God and you can know in your own heart of hearts and you won't have to have anybody tell you that God is real, the Bible is authentic, and Jesus' claims are true because you will know them for yourself. Now, how many of you today want to say, with the raising of your hand, number one, I understood this message. Raise your hand. That's all I'm asking. You understood it. Raise your hands high. Good. You're, okay, you understood it. Now, here's my second question. How many of you want to say, by the grace of God, because everything happens by His grace, His sovereign grace, by the grace of God, I want either to start or to continue to enter into that relational experience with Him so I can know these things for myself. How many of you want to say, I want to have that individual experience? Raise your hands high. Raise them with pride. No, not this half-bent stuff. Raise them high. I want to have that experience. Look, at I'm raising my hand too. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, You have spoken to us today, and Father, help us to know that what we know, we might not always be able to show, but we can know it in our heart of hearts. We can have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. This faith is not illogical or irrational. It is not a leap into the darkness. It's a step into the light. Father, I pray for the young people here today. I pray that they will begin thinking that there are sound, intelligent, reasonable reasons for them to believe in the truth claims of the Bible and the incredible matchless claims of Jesus. Father, forgive us for our doubting, our, our, our skepticism, our, our always vacillating back and forth and back and forth, in and out of faith, in and out of the Word, in and out of church. Father, give us an authentic experience with Jesus so that we will put our feet in Christ and put our feet in the church and put our feet in that faith once and for all. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International Copyright 2008, all rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls down 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace. Coming soon.